Polson, and this video is for Psychology 1100 Lifespan Development at Utah Valley University. And in it, we're looking at the first online quiz for Chapter 7, which is on early adulthood. Ten questions in this quiz administered on Canvas, and hopefully you've taken it already. Um, so now I'm going to tell you what the answers are. The first question is the first stage of adulthood, early adulthood, is usually considered to encompass what ages? So what are the ages for early adulthood? Choices are 18 to 30, 20 to 40, 25 to 30, and 30 to 40. Well, um, interestingly here, the uh, answer that the book gives us is 20 to 40, early adulthood, um, as opposed to mid or late. And so it goes a little higher than you might think and doesn't start at 18. Um, okay. Question number two is, in early adulthood, changes due to aging will begin gradually affecting which of the following systems? And they're A, cardiovascular, brain functioning, and vision, or B, respiratory, nervous, and muscular, or C, cardiovascular, immune, and respiratory, or D, vision, immune, and hearing. So it's sort of a mix and match here, but the one that you're looking for is C, cardiovascular, immune, and respiratory systems, will begin to uh, gradually age during early adulthood. Question number three. Americans have been ballooning in weight over the past half century or so. In the 1960s, 31.5% of adults aged 20 to 74 were overweight, so uh, not quite a third. And another 13% were obese, totaling 44.8%, so almost half. As of the middle 2000s, the numbers had swelled to which of the following? It's kind of cute, you know, balloon swell. Um, choices are 23.1% overweight, 25.7% obese for a total of 48.7%, 28.1% overweight, 32.2% over obese, adding up to 60.3%, 32.1% overweight, 35.2% obese to 67.3%, and 42.1% and 45.2%, adding up to 87.3%. Well, um, the answer here that you get from the book is this is the third one. It's C. Uh, most of you need to know that it, it adds up to 67.3%. That's about two-thirds. And so it's a little bit less than one-third are overweight, a little bit more than one-third are obese, and about so just very slightly more than two-thirds based on this uh, research. Question number four. Which of the following is the most effective way to manage stress? Um, I like this one. Drink moderate amounts of alcohol to relax. I'm just going to tell you right now, that's not the answer. But um, obtain social support, take anxiety, reducing medication, or temporarily ignore the problem. Well, it's kind of a silly uh, question. Um, not surprisingly, from our psychology textbook, the uh, correct answer here is obtain social support. It, it tends to have a tremendous buffering influence on a lot of stressors in life. Number five. One study shows that sexual activity peaks in the 20s, so people in their early 20s have more sex, uh, more sex partners. What are two main reasons for this? Well, opportunity and independence, maturity and excess, uh, independence and rebellion, or youth and opportunity. Again, it's a little bit of mix and match here. In this case, the book says that the uh, answer is youth and opportunity. So, um, although saying that peaks in their 20s because they're young, that's, that's not an explanation. You may recall that our book also talked about uh, college students uh, and that education is a liberalizing influence, but also the simple fact that there were more potential partners, greater opportunities. So anyhow, that's the one that will get you credit on the quiz. All right, number six, who created the theory of epistemic cognition? So we're looking for a name. Is it uh, Warner Shai, is it William Perry, is it Gisela Labouvie Vieff, or is it Albert Bandura? The person you're looking for right here is William Perry, who is associated with the theory of epistemic cognition. I talked about him a few times in the uh, in the lecture video. Number seven. According to Steele in 2005, highly traditional or insecure parents may find a young adult leaving for college so stressful that it damages the parent-child relationship. Why is this particularly true when female young adults are leaving? Okay, parents tend to feel jealous over the achievement. The females are more, more vulnerable out there in the world. Traditional families still feel that women do not need an education and mothers become jealous of the opportunities they were given. Well, um, interesting choices all the way around. The one that's going to get you credit is B. 
um, that for highly traditional or insecure parents, the belief that female, uh, I mean, these are adults we're talking about, that female adults are more vulnerable out there in the world. So that contributes to uh, some of the stress and the potential damage to the relationship. Number eight, Erickson, Eric Erickson, was criticized for suggesting that young adults who choose to remain celibate or single have failed a stage of development, are not developing normally, have not made it out of the adolescent state of development, or have an overdeveloped sense of self. Well, um, the most general answer here, the one we're looking at, is that they are not developing normally. Now, again, that's what Erickson said. People criticize him for it, and... You know, there's a lot to go on to this one. And in terms of determining what's normal and not normal, that's just a whole issue that I'm not going to deal with. Uh, let's go to question number nine. Feelings of attraction have been defined as which of the following? A, chemical responses that trigger a desire for another. B, psychological forces that draw people together. C, an evolutionary need to find a partner for safety. Or D, a requirement for romantic interest in another person, which sounds a little odd. Well, we're talking about feelings and attraction, not necessarily sexual behavior, because that can be a different thing. Um, the thing that we're looking at here is the psychological forces that draw people together, because the attraction is a psychological concept, um, as opposed to sort of sexual approach behavior. All right, number 10, last one in this quiz. Reciprocity is... The primary cause of problems in a relationship, an indicator of passion, part of Sternberg's intimacy model, or a potent determinant of attraction? Well, the answer is uh, D, that reciprocity is, in fact, a potent determinant of attraction. Somebody does something for you, you do it back. They say something to you, you say something similar back. Um, it, it induces liking and can contribute to attraction as well. Anyhow, that is the end of... Uh, the 10 questions to go into the first online quiz for Chapter 7 on Early Adulthood for the class Lifespan Development. Thanks for watching.